So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the defense of this thesis. The thesis is entitled Understanding Human Centric Images from Geometry to Fashion and will be defended by Edgar Simon Serra. So, anyway, you have the time. Okay. So, thank you for the introduction. So, as I said before, I'll be presenting my thesis today, so titled Understanding Human Centric Images from Geometry to Fashion. And it's I've been working on for the last four years at the Institute de Robotica Informatica Industrial under the supervision of Francisco Renoré and Carla Torres. So I'll start off with a bit of motivation. So um, when you see when a human sees an image like this, they're able to extract lots of different information. So you can first identify the salient objects here, which would be the two figures in the center, right? And if you had a bit of prior knowledge on what they're wearing, you could identify they're wearing kimonos, shiromuko, and that sort of stuff. And furthermore, you could identify this as being a Japanese wedding ceremony. And if you look a bit more, you would see there's figures in the front, and by estimating their pose, you could figure that they're playing instruments, so these are likely uh, people hired to participate in the ceremony. And further on in the back, you can see other figures that, by using sort of the relative context here, you can figure out these are probably the parents of the bride and the groom. And furthermore, in this particular example, you can identify the scene where this is going on without actually being able to see this. So you can guess that this is probably at a temple in Japan, right? So basically from a single image, using lots of different prior knowledge, different cues and relative information in this, you're able to get a high level understanding of this image, right? And so we'll probably see a more familiar example here. So here, the salient structure here is sort of a, a structure made by the people, right? So here, uh, there's a spatial, important spatial 3D structure. And furthermore, if you look at the background, you can see different groups of colors that you can identify. So you can sort of, uh, if you have the prior knowledge on this sort of culture events, you'll know this is Castilla's, right? And this is probably happening in, in Catalonia, as it is a Catalonian uh, well, sport, if you want to call it that way. And further on, you can also identify other roles, like for example, the background, the spectators, and, and then you identify, uh, yeah, this is likely happening in a ball ring, and it's probably also happening in summer during the active period of this. So this is um, basically what we can see is that from a single image, we can extract lots of information. Right? So location, context, roles, and relationships. And this is by uh, exploiting a lot of prior knowledge, right? prior models you build this. And to be able to actually reach these levels of understanding, you have to build models that start from the bottom up. So you have to use color information, low level stuff, then higher level stuff, sort of like pose and that sort of things. And finally, put all the pieces together to reach something higher. So, the, well, these examples would probably be more of the like the ultimate goal of computer vision. And in this thesis, we work in this direction in, in proposing some higher level tasks in the uh, context of fashion. So, the thesis has four major parts. I'll start out with an overview, then go into our feature point descriptors, which we present two works. One is a uh, deformation and illumination invariant delete descriptor, and also one based on uh, deep learning as been presented previously. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, 3D uh, human pose models or prior models. So uh, linear latent models, directed acyclic graphs, and uh, geodesic finite mixture models. Then I'll go into a bit higher level task, which would be 3D human pose estimation. We may have two works on uh, doing this from noisy observations and also doing it jointly for 2D and 3D. And finally, I'll give a more higher level overview of the tasks of fashion understanding, in particular two works of semantic segmentation of clothing and uh, modeling fashionability and wrap it up with conclusions. So a bit more villagely, what we'll start out is explaining the low level algorithms and approaches, which would be basically for the task of image description. Then we'll go into the prior models, which these are a bit more complicated and they, have a, they model more understanding of the world. And as an example, if you put these mid-level priors and these low level descriptors together, you can get a bit higher mid-level algorithms like pose estimation. And if you put all this together, you can reach higher levels of understanding, like uh, semantic segmentation, or even higher level, which would be understanding fashion and giving recommendations. So I'll start out with the low level, which is the feature point descriptors. And I'll start out talking of our first work, which is the deformation and light invariant Dali descriptor. So in this case, we're trying to tackle the specific problem of matching points of interest under non-rigid deformations and extreme lighting changes. So here we can see the 2011 ICC Barcelona t-shirt. This would be more or less flat with good illumination. And if you deform it and apply very harsh lighting, you get some sort of structure like this. So this is very hard to make out, and we want to actually be able to recognize and match points between these two sorts of images. 
So uh, the diffusion of heat has been used for 3D meshing, so, um, so matching 3D meshes. And this is because it's invariant to some of So if you imagine a piece of paper and you bend it inelastically, so there's no elastic deformation, the heat diffusion along this paper is the same, right? And if you have a person, for example, and you're moving your arm around, the heat diffusion from the fingers will be roughly the same. So this is no longer an isometry, but it's a, it's a fairly invariant deformation in this case. And the solution is given by the heat kernel signature. And furthermore, since we're calculating the heat diffusion, we have a temporal component here. So short temporal component, that means looking at the heat diffusion in a small interval of time, is basically looking at the local deformation. And if you look at it as a time tensor infinity, you're trying to capture the global structure of the mesh. And we apply this to images by treating the image as a 3D surface. So you can embed the image in 3D space, which is basically multiplying the grayscale value to get sort of a points in space, and then you can mesh these points to have a 3D surface. And once you have a 3D first surface, you can calculate the heat diffusion along the surface. And this can be used as a descriptor. And we can see here an example of uh, of our image and the uh, synthetic deformation. We can see the descriptor in this case is roughly the same. So that gives us invariance to deformation, but that does not work well for illumination. That is actually very uh, sensitive to scale, which in this case would correspond to illumination. So as uh, shown by Bronstein and uh, uh, Kokinos, you can actually use a fast Fourier transform to gain invariance to this scale. And you do this by sampling logarithmically, applying the fast Fourier transform, <coughs> and they prove that you can actually eliminate this scale component. And here you can see an example again of the synthetic deformation images, and if you don't apply the fast Fourier transform, you get these sort of curves. So as you decrease, increase in intensity, you get a big change in the descriptor. While, on the other hand, applying the fast Fourier transform, you get straight lines. So there's a small change. It's just robustness to elimination. Now, this sort of problem has not really been tackled. So in order to evaluate, we presented a new deformation and illumination data set. So there's 12 objects. And we have four different deformation levels. So here we can see two objects and how the deformation increases. And for illumination level. So we have two light sources, and by all the possible combinations, we can get very different illumination effects. And the notations were done manually, so we have correspondences between all pairs of images. We evaluated our descriptor here. We compared against the, the state of the art of handcrafted, so in particular the best performing other uh, descriptor would be the DAISY descriptor. And we can see we outperform it. And while we only get roughly three points when looking at only deformations, we get up to 15 points when looking at only illumination. And if you consider both things, you get roughly six points of performance. So it shows that we're really good, and especially in the illumination case. And if you use PCA to sort of decrease the dimension of this descriptor to get a sort of small representation, you see you still outperform DAISY, although you get a hit in performance. So, we can see that this, this is a fairly good descriptor, right? But now we'll go to learning descriptor. So now the, the entire trend is deep learning. So we tried to apply this for descriptors. And the way you do this is you use a technique called Siamese network. So you can't directly learn a descriptor from an image patch. You need sort of a concept of similarity. So we do this by learning from two image patches at the same time. So the input to our, our model during training is two patches and whether or not they correspond to the same object. And so each patch is run through a convolutional neural network. We have two of them that share the same weight. This gives us two descriptors. We can calculate the L2 or L3D norm on these descriptors and then apply loss on this. And the loss is basically saying we want to minimize the distance for the same descriptors and maximize the distance for descriptors that are different. And furthermore, this is a fairly non-standard problem, so we have to use many different tricks to get it. So the, just to give a bit of a, an example of the best performing result we have, we have a, it's implemented in Torch 7, so the input is a 64 by 64 image patch. It's run through a three-layer convolutional neural network with roughly 50,000 parameters, and this will give us a 128-dimensional uh, vector. So each layer has basically, uh, we are applying a convolutional kernel, followed by a hyperbolic tangent nonlinear activation function, a pooling layer, and the first two layers additionally have a contrast, local contrast normalization that uh, gives it a robustness to uh, local illumination changes.
So in order to have data to learn, what we use is we use structure from motion data sets. So here we have basically a 3D object and many different views from this object. And for the points in the images, we can get their 3D correspondences. And then by matching their 3D correspondences, we can get ground truth with these patches. So you get pairs of patches like we see here, and we can see that they more or less correspond to the same object, but we have varying levels of illumination, rotation, and uh, scale changes. And this is what we lose for learning and evaluation. So as you have pairs of positives, well, the positives is, is limited in number, so we have roughly 10 to the 6. Any two just patches that are not a positive are negative. So this gives us 10 to the 12 negatives. And we use a sampling approach to uh, learn from this. And furthermore, we find that in particular for this problem, very large amounts of mining are fundamental to get performance. So here we can see precision recall curves, and we're comparing against uh, SIFT and blue for different levels of mining. The first number corresponds to positive mining factor, and the second to negative. So a factor of two would mean that for every two samples you have, you only use the hardest one. We can see that if we don't do mining, we perform roughly the same as SIFT. And as you increase levels of mining, you get much, much better performance. But if you go too far, like uh, 16 by 16, you actually hurt your performance quite a bit. And in this case, we were using 8 by 8, which seems to give fairly good performance. For more evaluation, we uh, train on two structure for motion data sets and evaluate on one, and we compare against it. And we can see that uh, we get pretty good big bangs in, in performance for these different settings. And this is, once again, especially uh, critical to have high levels of mining here, using 8 by 8 for all cases. So that was sort of a, a talk on two different descriptors that we present, and as sort of conclusions on the descriptor work. Although SIFT is ambiguous in computer vision, there's better alternatives. So without even mentioning our works, DAISY, for example, gives better performance in SIFT based on more or less the same technology. And furthermore, by using descriptors that come from different algorithms, you can use them together in a complementary fashion that will help performance. And of course, here, the, the most important thing is to mention the trend from that is moving away from handcrafted features to learned features, which is especially strong in this field. Next, I'll talk about 3D human pose models, or prior models. So recalling this figure, we're moving a bit off. So now we're at the, sort of the lower mid-level algorithms. So what have people been doing in this? So you have, for example, shape models. Here, they're modeling pose and the mesh of the body together. And also Gaussian process dynamic models, which they try to uh, learn uh, periodic uh, dynamics. In the first case, they're learning meshes. In the second case, they're learning this joint set of uh, discrete set of 3D joints. And this is more similar to what we'll be doing. So to give a bit of an overview, people have been using things like Gaussian mixture models. Uh, I'll talk about four different aspects here. So first is complexity, is how hard it is to learn and use these models. Scales is how well it scales to really large amounts of data. Consistent is how well it is consistent with the pose manifold. So what do I mean by pose manifold? If you have the same individual moving, you know that their limb lengths are not going to actually deform or change. So you can model this as data being on a manifold. And for especially tracking applications, you want it to be consistent with this manifold as you'll have, uh, you're basically modeling implicitly a constraint that the person does not sort of deform as they move around. And the first aspect we'll look at is whether or not we're actually modeling our probability, uh, probability density function. So we want probable models as you can sample from them and you have a sort of a, a certain that this is actually a, a feasible or not configuration. So the uh, Gaussian mixture models, their main issue is that they're not consistent. Then next comes a family of probabilistic uh, geodesic analysis. These are modeled on the manifold, but they're not actually modeling the PDF. So this is our downside. The next three would be the family of Gaussian processes, which are fairly similar, but they depend cubically on the training data. So they do not scale well at all for data sets with over 1,000 points. And the last two here would be the restricted Boltzmann's machines and the mixture of factor analyzers, which are main issues that are very hard to learn and very sensitive to how you initialize them and the learning procedure. And in this work, I'll talk about three models which uh, have different uses. So the PCA or linear latent model, the DAG directed acyclic graph model, and the geodesic finite mixture model. And I'll start out talking about the PCA. So what we do in this work is you, well, what you do here is you basically try to model the pose as a linear combination of deformation bases. 
So x here would be a vector representing the 3D coordinates of all the different joints in the body. And this is equivalent to a sort of mean pose plus a set of weighted bases. So q here would be the basis, and alpha would be the new weight. So basically, it's a variable change from x to alpha. And if you represent it matrixly, you can have q alpha. And the main point here is that you're doing dimensionality reduction. So the dimensionality of alpha is going to be smaller than x. So how do you find these bases? So x sub 0 and q is, is something you find in learning. This is found using SVD on the covariance of the training data. And then you basically select that n sub m eigenvectors and let's to the largest eigenvalues as basis. And here you can see an example on, the, uh, on some human pulse data set. And you can see, for example, if you use five bases, you get roughly 99.5% of the covariance explained. And as you increase more, with 20, you get roughly 99.99%. .99%, and at 30, it is virtually 100%. So it's important to see here that without going to the full dimensionality, you can explain nearly all of the data. And to see this a bit more visually, you can see what's going on a bit here. So the first vectors are basically positioning the body roughly in 3D space, and the next one sort of improved the result. So here it's a bit hard to see, but if you look carefully, like comparing three with eight, you can see, for example, the left hand is matching much better, and also head is matching much better. And as you go a bit further, you can see what's happened here is the right leg is starting to snap much better. And this is uh, one way, and we'll s so this is very fast to both train and use. And the main advantage here is a linear formulation. And we'll show in a bit why this is actually very important. The downside is it's not probabilistic. So if you sample from this, you'll get uh, poses that are not actually very human-like. And this is a, a pretty big downside. So in order to sort of tackle this, we presented uh, directed a directed cyclic graph model. So here the idea is to model the pose with a graphical model. And this is a probabilistic graphical model, so you're encoding directly the plausible configurations. And additionally, since this graphical model is a directed acyclic graph, we can actually uh, use dynamic programming to uh, do inference here very efficiently. So basically, you have a sort of Latin set of nodes here on the left, and some of the nodes are corresponding to different groups of joints in the body. So, this is a discrete model, so in order to discretize the poses, we use k-means clustering on the different groups of poses to give us a sort of IDs that you can then associate with the different lab and states. And this is all learned using maximum likelihood. And as this is a directed acyclic graph, now you have efficient uh, functions that let you map from this latent states to the real 3D pose and <coughs> And finally, I'll talk briefly about another approach, which is using uh, geodesic finite mixture models. So here, what we decided to do is to try to directly model the probability density function of the data on the manifold. As we know, there's a manifold back here. And we propose a fully unsupervised algorithm that has a very efficient implementation. And the main idea, trick here is that we use a one tangent space per cluster. So what we're basically doing here is for each mixture, you'll have a mean defined on the manifold and the covariance defined in its tangent space. And this will give us a very well good approximation of this manifold. So a bit of a brief on this. So we're dealing with geodesic distances, which is basically distances using the manifold. And we're using tangent spaces, which is a local approximation. That here, what's important to re remember is that this, this is a tangent space at point P. What is important here is all the distances, Euclidean distances in this tangent space with the origin are geodesic distances. But uh, distances between arbitrary points are not geodesic distances. They're an approximation. And using this, we can uh, define uh, an expectation maximization type algorithm to learn the mixture model. So basically, there's two uh, variations we have here. The first is we use a minimum message length that lets us determine automatically the number of clusters. And then uh, we do a random initialization with a large amount of clusters that we slowly destroy as we do the optimization process. So for the expectation step, we basically assign the data softly to the different clusters. And then in the maximization, what we're doing here is we estimate the mean on the manifold using the geodesic mean. And then using the different tangent spaces, we can act, uh, estimate the covariance. And we can do this iteratively. And here, we can see an example application, which would be a quadratic surface with five clusters on it. This would be the cost of the function we're opt on. We're minimizing in this case. The vertical lines here would be when clusters get destroyed. And you can see it sort of goes down as we destroy clusters. And when you start destroying too many clusters, it goes up really strongly. And the best result would be increasing. 
and we can see an example of what we would find in this case. And we can see that these five clusters correspond to the five clusters here. So here they're colored in color, so we can see them, but the model does not actually see these colors. And what's more interesting is this can be applied to 3D human models. So we learn for different scenarios of different groups of actions. And we can learn these models. So if you sample from the models, you get these sort of distributions. And what's even more interesting here, as an application, we propose uh, doing regression, so hallucinating the limbs. So if you take a person and you chop off their left arm, you can try to predict the left arm given the rest of the body. So in this case, the black would be the pose. We chop off their arm, and our prediction would be this red, which is basically the map estimate of it. And what's interesting also is that this sort of regression task, so predicting the left arm, given the rest of the body, using a mixture model, gives you another mixture model. And if you sample from this mixture model, you get distributions like this. So in the first two examples, we can see that uh, it's actually around the ground truth. While in the third case, the prediction is pretty far away from the ground truth. But we can see that there's actually multiple modes. And if you were to use an exploration technique, you could probably match this using other priors to get uh, a better solution near the ground truth. And so that was all for these human pose priors. So to give a summary, there's very different ways to model the pose. Each model has different strengths and weaknesses, and plus exploiting more known properties is beneficial for improvement. And in the next section, we'll see some of these models in action. So now I'll talk about 3D human pose estimation. So here we're going up a bit more, and now we're using the lower mid-level and low-level things to try to do a sort of higher level task although it's still what I would consider mid-level. So the task here in particular is we have a single input image and an internal calibration record, so we know that the camera is calibrated. An image like that, and we try to predict the 3D joints, so a discrete set of 3D joints representing the pose of the body. In this case, the red would be our prediction, and the green would be the ground truth. So we have two different ways to doing this. I'll talk about the first one, which is doing this from noisy observations. So this is a pipeline approach, and it's divided in three major parts. So in the first part, given the image, we run a 2D uh, body part estimation algorithm. And this basically gives us something like this. So these are um, means of their estimation with associated covariances. So it's basically telling us, giving some, us some sort of noisy estimation of the 2D pose. And then I'll explain a bit, but we have a way of projecting this set of 2D Gaussians into a sort of a 3D hyper Gaussian. And we can sample from that. And finally, we have a classifier, which will give us a most human-like pose of this, which will be the solution to use. So how do we do this? So first, we, have, uh, we write a camera projection um, problem as mx equals 0. So here, x is a 3D pose we're trying to solve. And n has the camera calibration parameters and also the 2D observations. So basically, what this is doing is m is constraining x to project to the image proper. Uh, so it's basically a set of constraints. If you solve this, you get a set of solutions. But there's actually a linear subspace of solutions. As if you take the person, make him a bit bigger, and push him back, it'll give you the same projection. So this is a rate to generate system. But we have our PCA that we talked about before, which is also a linear system. So you have two linear systems. You put them together, and you get a new linear system. So now instead of solving for x, we're solving from alphas. The q x sub 0 is learned, and m is basically the input. And since this is linear, what we can do is we can actually propagate these 2D Gaussians through that linear system over there. So the mean is basically solving that with the pseudo inverse. And the uh, covariance is a bit trickier, but you can uh, also solve that in closed form. And basically, this, in this case, uh, this set of 2D Gaussians would become something like this, which you can now sample from. And you would use a classifier to disambiguate the best one. So to see some results on this, so the first column, we're showing the input image with the projection of the 3D ground truth. Second column would be examples of the, the 2D pose estimation algorithm. The third column is the best uh, result we can obtain with the PCA. This would be our, our lower bound. The fourth is the best result from the sampling. So this is what we want to find, actually. This would be, uh, the fifth column would be basically some sort of heuristic approach, which we can see fails horribly in some cases. So this is using some sort of reprojection error and that sort of stuff. 
And if you use a classifier, you can see you're usually getting very close to the best reconstruction errors, so the best sample you find. And we see that works very well. And in a bit, I'll give the, also a quantitative analysis on this. But next, to talk about doing both 2D and 3D pose estimation in joint. So uh, why do we want to do this jointly? When you use a pipeline approach, if the 2D pose estimation is bad, you're never going to be able to recover from that. So basically, your 3D is also going to be bad. But if you do this jointly, you're going to actually be able to recover this and basically use as many priors and as much information together to do a better job. So we do this by first, uh, we consider the image evidence, so consider to be independent for each part. So you have the probability of the image evidence D given the 2D pose, so the set of 2D poses L, is equivalent to the product of it independently for each of the 2D parts. So you're saying the knee and the head are independent in this case. Now, if you use Bayes' rule, and you also consider that the probability, so we're not actually looking for 2D pose, right? We're looking for the result of a 3D pose projected to 2D. So we can say this 2D is not actually 2D, this 2D comes from a 3D pose. But furthermore, we know this is not all of a 3D space. We know there's some sort of a smaller latent model generating this. So the 2D comes from 3D, but this 3D comes from a latent space H, and then we have a prior over H. So if you work it out down here, basically you get the probability of the 3D given the image evidence is proportional to a generative model, which is the 3D given the latent space and the prior on the latent space, times a discriminative model, which is basically projecting the 3D to 2D and scoring it by the output of some sort of detectors. So uh, visually it would be something like this. So we have the directed cyclic graph model I talked about before. We can sample from this model. And then these samples get ranked by a set of 2D part detectors, and we can optimize over this. And until some convergence criteria, which gives us the best result. So we can show this a, a bit different way. So this is basically the same figure as before. We're optimizing over the Latin spaces, right? And you get results like this. So this is uh, two actions and three subjects. We can see some good results and two different types of failures. So we have depth errors. This problem is inherently ambiguous as in, for example, in this case, um, both projections are, are projecting almost to the same, but there's a displacement on the uh, axis of the camera of roughly 30 centimeters. And there's actually no way to resolve this without using even stronger priors to fit for the ball. And other type of failures here is when you have basically the whole, many detectors are failing in a chain way, and when too many detectors fail, our model is unable to recover. So what's Interesting is that our 2D is trained on another data set, on a 2D data set, so we can actually evaluate on random images. And we evaluated on the TOD stat minute sequence, and we can see, um, so what we're doing here is we're running the algorithm independently for each of the person. And what's really nice here is that when we look at the 3D, we can see that even though we're not modeling the ground plane here, we can see that sort of the ground plane is being found by an algorithm. So we're running it independently for each person, but we're sort of finding some coherence between all of them. And to give some sort of quantitative number analysis, so here we compare our, the two models I presented, the joint model and the noise observations, and we compare against two tracking models and a model that uh, does single image, but they're doing background subtraction, which is a really strong hypothesis. Now we can see that we do fairly competitive, and what's more important to note here is that by actually doing a joint model, you're able to improve quite a bit on using the 2D estimations, mainly because these 2D estimations are very noisy, and that is very hard to recall. So we did fairly well in this. And to summarize, uh, 3D human pose estimation is a very ambiguous problem, and it's very hard mainly because the 2D evidence is very unreliable. And to be able to overcome this, you have to use strong models or strong priors to get good performance. Furthermore, using joint and more uh, formal models perform best because you can exploit all the different information in the shape of priors and delay the decision until the end. So now I'll go to maybe a, a more fun topic, right? So which is uh, trying to understand fashion. So here it's uh, the end of this, right? So here we're trying to do a really, really high level task. And for this, we'll be using all the lower, mid-level, and low-level stuff we've talked about. So the first task is that of cementation of clothing. So in this case, you're basically trying to uh, assign a label to each pixel in the image, and uh, this label can be one of the different uh, clothing garments. So we have, uh, 
and like this, but uh, roughly 50 different. And the main issue here is that fashion, as you know, has a lot of variability. So this re uh, results in a lot of inter and intra class variability. And furthermore, looking at this image, you can see these different girls. This girl is wearing a cardigan. These two are wearing blazers. So this is fairly hard to make out. And furthermore, if you look at their legs, she is not wearing anything. These two are wearing what would be tights, and this would be stockings, right? And furthermore, this data set also has leggings. So, I mean, if you try to ask most people here, what's the difference between tights, stockings, and leggings? I'm not sure anyone will be able to get that. Right? And so that's the sort of problem we're trying to handle. So our contribution in this particular work is a 30% over the state of our performance. And we do this by uh, having an efficient model that can dress a person and proposing a uh, noble potential to exploit the task. So this would be an example input image, example in ground truth. This would be the previous state of the art, and this would be our model. And we can see that it, it's much more uh, visually pleasing in this sense. So the model here is basically a conditional random fields model. We have two types of variables. The first would be super pixel label. So why do we use super pixels? For two reasons. First, it reduces the number of variables in the model. And plus, super pixels have a fairly large support area, which make it so if you train classifiers on these super pixels, they're much more discriminative. So you can get much better performance. And each uh, super pixel is a variable, and it can have one to the number of classes as possible states. And here we would have an example. And next, we use limb segment label. So what does this mean? This is, uh, we know we're handling people, so we can run a 2D pose estimation algorithm, and then we can try to dress this thick person. So we're using Young and Raman and CPR 2011. And what happens now is that for each segment here, we're trying to assign it a class. So basically, we're trying to dress it. Right? And the trick we do here is that people are symmetric, and they dress as such. So what does that mean? That instead of having a separate variable for left and right leg, we use a single variable for both. So symmetric pairs are collapsed into one. And this lets us implicitly force symmetry in the model, right? Now, the model is basically a um, pairwise model. And I'll first of all talk about unary potentials. These are unary potentials on the super pixels. So the first type is uh, what we call simple features, which is basically Yamaguchi et al.'s work. It's 2012 CDPR. And this is color, texture, and location histograms. Location histograms are basically distances from the 2D pose. And if you, for example, for this input image with this input uh, 2D pose estimation, ground truth would be this. And just using these features, you would get some sort of estimation like this. This is not very good. It's bleeding in the background. And uh, that's something we want to improve. So we use other potentials, like the person mass. So this is CPM C foreground background segmentation algorithm. And this will give us images like this. So we can see it's not perfect. It's missing half the body. But it can help us to say clothing should be on here. Then we use what we propose, clothelets. Clothelets are basically a spatial prior for the different classes. So given only the pose, without looking at the image itself, you're basically saying, if the pose is on this person, you want the socks to be here. And you want the jacket to be on here. So you're basically telling the algorithm to never try to put socks on her head, for example. And this is just a, a simple prior we use, and it works fairly well. And we also use uh, better features, which are enriched SIF descriptors with second order pooling, Karina Shinyashesko's ECCD 2012. And you can see that while this does fairly better for the main body, we have lots of spurious firing on the background. And for pairwise, we first use uh, similarity between super pixels. So this is um, the selective search paper, right? Ujang et al. 2013. And we, for different pixels, we have a classifier trained on the shape color and texture similarity. And basically, things that look similar should have the same label. And we have connections that try to enforce this. And we also, I mean, we're not using limb segments at all. So we use them by putting pairwise connections between the super pixels that intersects with the limbs. And we put connections like that. And this will help us enforce the symmetry. So to see a sort of overview of the model, this would be input images. This would be the ground truth. Here we would have the foreground background mask. This would be the, the second order pooling shape features. It would have some sort of limb connections. This would be simple features. And by putting it all together, we would get this sort of thing. So we can see that the features independently do not do that well. But by putting it all together, we can get very good results. Right? And for quantitative evaluation, we run it on the fashionista data set, roughly 700 images. 
we do 2956 class settings, and we can uh, use Descartes index or intersection over union isometric. And we compare against Yamaguchi's two papers, his 2012 CVPR and 2013 ICCD. And we can see we get roughly 60% in both cases over his 2012. And his 2013, we get 30%, but he is using roughly 300,000 additionally weekly labeled images. So it's not really a fair comparison. You would have to compare with one where we get the 60% improvement. And since we all like looking at pictures of pretty girls, here we can have more uh, qualitative examples. And we can see that our algorithm is much more convincing relatively. So we don't have this sort of artifacting that's going on around here. And this happens in all the cases, even though we don't get that good performance, because here it looks very nice, but the pants is a different color, right? So we are got the wrong class here. Next, I'll talk on a bit higher level task, and here we're trying to directly model fashionability. And so what we do here is we first present a large novel data set, 140,000 posts. A post is basically an image with associated metadata right, from a social uh, fashion website. And we propose a model that is able to understand and model fashionability through different components and give advice. So in this particular image, we have this uh, girl. Our prediction of our algorithm gives it a claustrophobic type setting. We're seeing this user belongs to cluster type 20. And she's wearing a blue-brown jacket with a predicted fashionability of 2. So that's a bad score. So what we want to do is we want to help this poor girl to do better, right? <laughs> and how can we do this? So we run our algorithm, and we can actually predict what she should wear to improve. So if she were to wear a black casual type outfit, two examples are shown here, she would improve up to a 7. And I mean, she would probably be happy, right? So this is an example of a post from the data set to give an introduction on the metadata. So we have, for example, the user, the date, the photos. Then we have uh, user details like their location, the number of followers. We have different comments people are giving on this. We have user provided tags. The website also provides uh, colors here. So this would be associated to the different garments they're wearing. And the user are also provided what exactly they're wearing and actually where you can buy it if you're interested. And furthermore, there's some sort of metadata that is a vote in the favorites on this, and also the number of comments. So what's important here is that we sort of manipulate the votes and use this as a proxy for fashionability. So given the image and all the rest of the metadata, we're essentially trying to predict the votes in a more sophisticated way. So uh, we have different features, right? So we're using, for example, uh, classifiers to get style and scene information also deep networks for face recognition type stuff, sentiment analysis on the comments, and also bag of words type stuff for the tag features. And what we do is then we try to model explicitly different aspects of fashion. So we consider four different aspects. So the user, the outfit they're wearing, the setting they're in, and also the, the fashionability, which is what we're trying to predict. So what we do is we manually assign the different features to different uh, the, the uh, nodes. So for example, for the user node, we assign the face recognition stuff and also their number of fans. And we build a really, really small deep network on top of this. And what we do is we put all these deep networks together by connecting them at the end with a softmax layer. And we learn this to try to predict fashionability. And once this is learned, what we do is we throw the softmax layer and we end up with four complementary feature extraction deep networks. So these are performing dimensionality reduction and converting these lower level features to some sort of mid-level features. And once we have this, we can use the output of these different deep networks and put it into a CRF type architecture. The CRF has four nodes corresponding to each of the different components we talked about before. And the output of the network is connected here. And there's a fully connected pairwise network. And here we note that we're only actually seeing the fashion of it. So the users, the setting, and the outfit are latent. And we initialize them with k-means. And then we learn this all by uh, maximum likelihood. And now this gives us a model that can, you can run on a mid, and it will predict you fashion ability by predicting also the user type of user, the setting, and the outfit they're wearing. So some quantitative results. So the deep network gets roughly 30% accuracy. So it does fairly well. If you use a CRF, you decrease accuracy a bit more. But it's much better than uh, baselines, random initialization, and also a simple logistic regression. But why do you want the CRF if the deep network does better, of course? right? So what's the motivation behind this? So 
So what we can do is, with the CRF, we can actually give fashion advice, which we cannot do directly with a deep network. So what we do is basically you grab an image, like for example, this image, you run the algorithm, now you've estimated the user, the outfit, the setting, and also their fashion ability score. So she's a pink outfit and a score of three. And what you do now is you say, okay, so assuming the setting and the user are fixed, now we try to estimate the outfit that maximizes the fashion ability. So maximum of priority estimate of the conditional inference on the model. And this will basically now give you different states with their associated scores. So this girl, if she were to wear a heels type outfit or a pastel shirt skirt outfit, she would increase up to an eight. And by doing this, we can give a recommendation to all these different sort of people. So that was it for that. And basically, conclusions on this. So fashion is very challenging. And I mean, it's very really hard for people too, not just algorithms. So it's a generalized problem. And to be able to do well, you need a proper framework. So in here, we mainly talk about using conditional random fields because there's probabilistic frameworks. Like you can encode lots of strong priors here. And furthermore, you really have to work really well to tailor both the model and the potentials to the specific problem and, and exploit as much information as possible. Otherwise, it's pretty much impossible to do. And what's most important about this problem is there's lots of room for improvement, right? So that means we can do lots more research on this, and that's what's fun about it. And so this was sort of uh, picked up by the news. So we can see we've appeared in Cosmopolitan, L, Vogue Spain, and apparently, we've also solved fashion. I, I mean, I just learned about this last week, right? So no, no, no. <laughs> there are news reports for this. So to wrap up about this, so I talked about four major aspects. So feature point descriptors, generative 3D human pose models, 3D pose estimation, and the more interesting topic maybe of, of fashion understanding. Of course, I mean, this is all backed up with uh, a number of publications. So they're all computer vision joints. So we have computer vision uh, um, pattern recognition conference. And in one of them, we also got best paper in the international conference on machine vision applications in Tokyo. And uh, to wrap it up, so I presented in this thesis is sort of a low level, uh, low to high level overview of different uh, algorithms for human centric computer vision. And what's interesting here is that pretty much everything computer vision and machine learning are extremely intertwined. So to be able to do these tests. So it's, uh, it's the days of just doing computer vision without any machine learning are pretty much gone, sadly. And also, to do high level things, you can't really expect to invent everything yourself. So you have to stay up to date and exploit as many in existing tools. You can also propose your own, but you cannot just depend on you doing everything from low to high level. And additionally, for most of the thesis, code is available at my website. So sort of future directions, what do we want to do? We want to do more things together. We want to do more real world applications and also use better features like uh, deep networks and not forget what our original motivation is. So we want to understand fully these sort of images from everything from fashion, 3D pose to also what's going on. So finally, I would like to thank my directors, collaborators, friends, family, supporters, and everyone for coming here today and most importantly, my two cats for a win. Without, I would have not been able to finish the test. So, yeah, Rasputin and Nuria. And so that was all. So I'll be glad to take uh, all of your questions. And thank okay. you for listening and coming. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, then move to the questions. Uh, we are three in the jury. And uh, I was commenting before that we're going to start it for the person who, who comes from far away. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Okay, yeah. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the presentation. So that was very clear and very, very dense, uh, but uh, it's uh, difficult to, to avoid uh, given the, uh, the work you did uh, while you were doing your uh, work PhD. And uh, yeah, so definitely it's, uh, it's a very nice work, but uh, I can say still have to ask, uh, to ask uh, some questions. Um, uh, so f first of all, okay, so maybe in, uh, if we are back at the, at the beginning, uh, what is the difference really between fracking and uh, the, uh, I would say, standard uh, mining of difficult examples? So is it just a, a fun name, which I like, uh, but yeah. or is there something which is uh, uh, fundamentally different or at least different? Uh, so I think the, the main thing is that uh, usually you don't do such high levels of, of mining. 
mm -hmm. in these problems. So, so the main difference is uh, the degree. The magnitude of The magnitude, yeah, and how important it is. And, and um, fracking comes actually because we sort of thought, you mine a lot, I mean, that's sort of... <laughs> But so what do you mean by the magnitude exactly? So the so uh, we're using, we use a batch of 1024 and we only use 128 hardest of that. Mm -hmm. So this gives you a fairly big overhead in the learning process since mm -hmm. you're evaluating on many samples and you're throwing most of them away. Mm -hmm. But we actually find that without this, I mean, the difference in performance is abysmal. Mm -hmm. So uh, it basically comes on that. But it's not different from the, the negative mining. It's just that in this particular problem, it's extremely fundamental. Without it, you do not get it. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, um, so, um, you then you s so you wrote somewhere in the manuscript, but you, do, you, okay, you didn't mention that uh, today, but um, you say that the 3D, so the estimating the 3D pose of, the, of a human is more difficult than estimating the 3D pose of a sur deformable surface. I'm not sure I'm very con So you say that somewhere in the, so in the introduction to justify uh -huh. that you need a new method to compare to what Frances uh, did, uh, saying that the, um, the estimation of the 20 poles of a human mm -hmm. is more difficult because there are more degrees of freedom than a deformable surface. Okay. I'm not very convinced. Um, Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, I know what you are. So uh, the main thing is that if you have a, a deformable surface, I mean, that's complicated, but everything is, the motion is highly correlated among it, right? While in a human, you have much less correlation across the joints. So basically, mm -hmm. you have a deformable surface, you have yeah, like a really high that, yeah. amount of degree of freedom, but the real number of degree of, of freedom, if you want to put it some way, is very small. Mm -hmm. Well, for a human pose, you have much larger deformations and much larger space of deformations for the different joints. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why, because with the surface in general, so I mean, I guess if you look at surface, and it depends also how you mesh it, mm -hmm. you can probably get the higher levels of complexity, but everything is, it's more highly correlated. So I agree that you have a lot of connections mm -hmm. and then they can, uh, so while the, the one leg or one limb in mm -hmm. general can move freely compared to the, to the rest. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that I agree. But so you can. What is difficult is probably so the, the, the ambiguities of the so the mirror uh, the mirror ambiguities mm -hmm. when you don't know where in which direction compared to the camera. Mm -hmm. The limb is pointy, and with the deformable surface, you can have a lot of these ambiguities. Yeah, yeah I, I mean it, it depends what problem you're tackling in particular. But I mean for yeah, so I agree that if you look at for example a, a shirt for example, mm -hmm. it would be very complicated. But looking, for example, at the typical a piece of paper, yeah, piece of paper that's bending yeah. in that particular case. Okay, so that's okay. That's it's more a matter of application. So maybe for some application, like we, yeah. that uh, yeah. in general you have a lot of. In general, for people tracking, you there is you always have all these ambiguities all together. Mm. In, in, in one sequence, you have all the the, the mirroring ambiguities that can uh, that can happen. Uh, but uh, okay. that's of course true. I, I suppose I was, I was thinking more of um, like medical type applications. So like a heart is a deformable surface, but mm -hmm. everything is extremely correlated and you have yeah, maybe one or two degrees of freedom. But if you think of it as like shirts, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a, yeah, you can have a, a shirt that's very complicated and plus you have a, half of it is always included. Mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. So in that case, it could be very complicated, yes. And so if you had to do the, the pose estimation again, uh, uh, how would you do it? So that's because there is something that you, in my opinion, that you are miss. There is some information that you are missing, mm -hmm. or that you are that you are forgetting. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I would like to hear more from you. So if I were to do three pose estimation again, how would I handle it? Yeah. So I would probably yeah. So um, I think the main issue with our three D pose estimation. So right now, especially with a geodesic model, which we haven't actually applied to three D pose estimation yet. Mm -hmm. We have a much better prior on the 3D pose, mm -hmm. but right now the main weakness is, uh, I think, the pure experience. Mm -hmm. So in this work, we were using uh, basically uh, uh, sliding window hog templates, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and right now that is yeah. not acceptable at all. So the main thing to work on would be probably to use deep networks for, for the appearance model. Okay, so there is that, but also to solve, uh, okay, so of course you can improve the, uh, the, the 2D detection, so the 2D mm -hmm. animation, but to solve the ambiguities, actually. 
can you, so the, the, the case of the person with disease, can you do more or is there something or more information that you can use? Well, what's nice about the, the geodesic model we presented mm -hmm. is if you were assuming you had an oracle that would tell you if something is occluded or not, mm -hmm. you can get a really nice prior mm -hmm. on the occluded part getting the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th in that sense, we could do something. So, mm -hmm. it had maybe some ambiguities directly, but the main issue is thing coming from the parents to actually detecting this sort of ambiguities. So you could probably do some sort of model where you would try to actively at the same time estimate the different occlusions of the body and you could probably integrate it with uh, what we presented since you okay, guys so did this. But, okay. mm -hmm. but I was thinking about uh, for humans actually, so the, there is probably some ambiguities in some images, but we have just from one image we have a pretty good idea of the pose of the, of the person. So that's just with just a little, very little cues and very piece, small pieces of information we can actually, so there was a paper from mm -hmm. uh, David Fleet uh, uh, where they were uh, detecting the, uh, trying to estimate the, uh, so the mirroring or, the, or to solve the mirroring ambiguities with a classifier saying that mm -hmm. this, this part of the, the, the limb like that or like, like mm -hmm. that. I think there is still a lot of information in the image that you don't text. Oh, that, okay, I know, mm. I know it's difficult. That's, yeah, not, yeah. that's not the problem. But maybe there is still something that you can uh, that, you, that can be exploited to solve the ambiguities before going to the 3D so um, or mm. the 3D reasoning. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I definitely. I think uh, for 3D human posts, probably the most interesting area of research is actually occlusion. And mm -hmm. ambiguity handling. It's not only yeah, it's not uh, yeah, it's not only ambigu uh, occlusion, but it's also the ambiguity yes. and the, the orientation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of a few pixels, but yeah, yeah, I think yeah. the information is almost uh, almost there most of the uh, most of the mm -hmm. time. Uh, um, uh, yeah. So and I also for the so I'm actually I'm very interested by the segmentation work and so that's <laughs> the, the results are, are very nice. And, uh, so you you mentioned the uh, the fashion magazines and um, things that we that as a computer scientist uh, it's clear that I don't know, uh, but uh, there is also the, the new scientist uh, which is uh, that mm -hmm. was uh, referencing your work and so which is yeah. uh, that was featuring your work. Mm -hmm. It's also a reference that. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, that's actually what we actually got interviewed for the new scientist, and then mm -hmm. everyone, all the other people, just copy pasted that. <laughs> and, and so it started from the new. Uh, the yeah, and if you see, they start saying we do Instagram, and we've never actually done Instagram. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. someone copy pasted and put Instagram, and. <laughs> okay, but uh, okay, that's how the world uh, works these yeah. days. But but okay, I would I would put still the new scientist uh, above uh, Vogue or uh, something or at least. Well, yeah, uh, it was more fun for no, 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 thematic. But on, on the website, I put properly. I put new <laughs> science and that sort of thing. So don't worry about it. Yeah. So the, the but uh, yeah. So the second, uh, I'm more interested in the segmentation mm -hmm. results, which are very very nice. Mm -hmm. and, um, so can you comment a little bit more? So you did that in the uh, in the manuscript, but can you comment a little bit more on the the uh, what makes your algorithm? Uh, perform that way because there is a lot of things uh, going on. Mm. There are many different features, uh, many different post or constants, or at least uh, terms in your objective function. Okay. Uh, uh, what is really is it really everything put all together or that's yeah? So what is the what is the truth? So oh, yeah, we, the, we uh, and ju just uh, <laughs> before uh, I let you answer, um, you. Um, you don't really use your work on the 3D pose estimation here. You, you no. could have used it, but maybe could. the 3D pose is an overkill, I don't know. No, it, the, so the main issue here is um, you do not have a 3D pose. So you cannot build a 3D pose model for these people because you have no 3D poses for this. So while annotating 2D poses mm -hmm. is very cheap, mm -hmm. like, uh, in this case, annotating 3D poses is much more. You mean for the learning? Yeah, so we have we have no way we can learn a 3D pose, so we can't learn a 3D pose prior for these sort of images because there is no sort of 3D pose data set for this sort of images. Yeah, so you already have a, yeah, you have a 3D pose data set, but the images are probably too different, uh, but you do not work. Yeah, as so, so the problem is, if, if we actually had mm -hmm. people doing these sort of poses with mm -hmm. 3D, then we could actually learn a model and try to apply it here. So do you think it would help to have the 3D or maybe? I think in this particular, so the place it would help would be that, um, so here we're 
clogging fashion, right? So uh, one of the main parts you have is you have lots of occlusions by clothes of the parts. So you can't actually see the silhouette of the people, right? Mm -hmm. so especially if they wear like a, a wedding type dress. You have no idea where the legs are. Mm -hmm. And with 2D, that is very harmful. While well, if you had a 3D model, you could actually sort of establish uh, physical 3D constraints, which would improve the 2D estimation in, in this case. So I think it would be beneficial, especially when, the, when you have really approving clothes, really baggy clothes, really big, and that sort of thing. But yeah, but the main thing here is you have no, no data to train a 3D model. So that's, a, that's the main reason we were not able to do anything with that here. So what is the magical feature that makes everything work? So what is that? So here, it, it's, a, it's actually a combination, but mm -hmm. what we found was that for this problem, the second order pooling SIFT mm -hmm. feature, so, so this one, mm -hmm. is very, very, very good. Right? So this by itself outperforms this approach. So it's, uh, so it's just the local appearance? Well, this helps a lot, mm -hmm. but the main thing you have is um, this has this sort of firing stuff like that. So what also helps a lot is the CPMC algorithm. The background so, so, so the background segmentation, what it really gives you is a really strong priority. I mean, you can see in this case, it is nearly perfect. So the main thing, what's missing here is it's missing the interior of our legs, and it's missing a bit here. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, it is almost, so, and this gives a really strong prior that tells you basically put clothes here and put clothes not here. So these two, mm -hmm. uh, these two are probably the biggest reason this works. And then the other ones, if you look at the, the manuscript, I mean, we have results of yeah, what yeah, happens yeah, if you yeah. take this out, they help. Increase. So basically, this sort of model, you have to just put more stuff, put more stuff to try to increase the problem because it's, I mean, we get that as I showed in, in other results. I mean, the type of problem we have here mainly is we do a fairly, I mean, this looks really nice, mm -hmm. but the pant is wrong. And this is going to really, really hurt your, your intersection over union score. But so I'm not sure I, I understand how you use the shift, so the mm -hmm. shift. Um. So, what do you actually use pairs of pairs of uh, descriptors? Or no, no. So what what they do is basically um, there is a CPMC paper. He used this as a feature. So basically, for each super pixel, mm -hmm. you calculate densely sift, mm -hmm. and then when you pool them, you don't pool it with only first order statistics. You do it with second order just statistics. So you're learning basically sort of a correlation between all the sift descriptors in the image. In the super pixel, right? Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they apply a PCI on this, and then you get a sort of a 4,000 or, no, it was pretty big. It was like 40,000 dimensional vector for each super pixel. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we train a classifier on top of that that tries to predict the different classes. And so as a feature, what we have is we have the output of one classifier for each class. So basically, it gives mm -hmm. us a sort of prior mm -hmm. of this pixel, how likely it is to be for all these different classes. Okay. And then this gets reweighted by the CRF, mm -hmm. and the CRF uses this in car with the other stuff to learn. Okay. So it's basically yeah, some sort of, it's, it's the same approach here. So basically you have one classifier per class for each super pixel. The only difference is here they use all these sort of histograms, which would be uh, first order pooling. Mm -hmm. And here they're using uh, SIFT with second order pooling. And this second order pooling really helps. But then it's only uh, local information. It's not. Yes. I would have expected so that I know to, uh, the the close let uh, to be much more important actually. But well, the close let helps pretty much. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, it's fairly complementary with this one. Mm -hmm. So here you also have the location. So the close let is only a prior. It's it's only a prior of the location. Yes. Compared to the yeah, but it basically is yeah. for each of the joints in the two D pose. Mm -hmm. You pool, so you, you basically get the average activations in the training data. So then when you have the pose, you basically have some sort of template that you stick on each and then you sort of put them together. And that gives you these uh, about previous activations, right? So it gives you this sort of activations, mm -hmm. which is basically, I mean, you can sort of see the boxes here. Also. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this helps you sub make some, so what's important about this is while it does not help that much in performance, it really helps to make, not make stupid mistakes. Day, uh, big mistakes. So, okay. so the, the thing is, we get really nice results, which is, I mean, it looks reasonable. Mm -hmm. So result, the performance <laughs> is not that good, but the results look reasonable. And that's in part because of the closets. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Again, okay, so we'll move to Okay, uh, thank you very much for the clear presentation. Uh, also the thesis, it was a pleasure to read, very well written. Thanks. and. Uh, well published, so congratulations there.
Um, yeah, maybe we can start at the chapter six. Yeah, chapter here. Six, okay. So we keep here. So this uh, second order of Poland, mm -hmm. which is a very strong feature. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, is it possible to do third order pooling? <laughs> Does that make any sense? Uh, I'm not sure. You would probably gain something, but the problem here is that already with second order pooling, you're getting like 500,000 dimensional things. So I mean, it's really big and you have to use PCA. Hmm. With third order pooling, that would be just enormous, oh. enormous. And it would be very slow to compute because now you're starting to compute pairs for everything. So. Probably would be possible if you have enough data, but you might do better just learning a deep network, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so that would bring me to my, ne my next question. Mm -hmm. So the second order, because to maybe still save this ID, ID in the deep network mm -hmm. era, is it possible to make second order pooling layers instead of first order pooling layers? Oh, okay. Would that be an ID? So, so that could, so let me think how you would do that. So, the, mm, you could probably do something like that, but the thing is, pooling in deep network is for sort of dimensionality reduction. And if you do second order pooling, I mean, it's not, you would probably stay the same dimension or even get a bit bigger. So would it be beneficial? Maybe, but it's sort of doing a different, so it's, it's, it's a different thing. You're trying to use richer information, which the network is trying to learn anyways instead of trying to make it smaller so you can be more efficient. So could you do it? Probably. Is it a good idea? I'm not that yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> but even in, in, in traditional features, this second order pooling is a little bit strange. Oh, yeah. So it, it, it is like I'm doing pooling, but I don't really want to lose all the information. So I, mm. I, I blow. How, do, how, how would you compare this with Fisher pooling, for example, which is also very similar, maybe? So, well, yeah, Fisher, yeah, so Vlad and that sort of stuff, I mean, it's comparable, except the difference is there you're using an, uh, uh, like a, a, a Gaussian mixer model to learn a dictionary, right? Mm. So, um, it's different. So, the good thing about second order pooling is you're not actually um, losing any learning at all, right? So, it's just statistical. Yeah. Well, with Vlad, you then sort of depend on your sparse dictionaries and that sort of stuff. So is it better? It sort of depends on your application. In this particular problem, we have very few images and we cannot very learn really good models. And that's why we're mainly sticking to logistic regressions and stuff. But if you had enough data, maybe it would be better to use Vlad, Fisher, information vectors and that sort of thing. But in this particular problem, we try to use as much as um, as little learning as we can, <laughs> to say it some way. Um, let's see, the, the recommendation system, you yes. very quickly explained that. Okay. And, uh, so I was wondering, because you say I change the output and then I recompute the fashionability, but what happens with comments, reviews, and text? So the text could say high heels, or the comments could say, hey, what a nice shirt, and then you change the shirt for a jacket. So what did, what uh, did you do with the, let's say with the, with the notes here? Yeah. So, um, so first how it works, so basically you have these four nodes, right? So you run an, an image with its metadata and you'll basically have a state for all of these nodes, right? Uh, yeah, there's no blackboard here. But uh, basically you can see this as different factors, right? So you have different factors here. And so what you do is that then you fix these two and these now become features, right? Potentials to these different ones. So factors to these two nodes. And now you only have these two. And basically now, since it's actually a tree, you can just brute force it. So basically you calculate all the possible combinations of states, you calculate the loss for all of these states with these additional features. And then you can basically uh, try to find the outfits that maximize the fashionability. And since you're actually brute forcing it for all of them, you can actually sort it. And you can get the score for all the different outfits. That's but, how but, but okay, do you agree that sometimes you should so the there might be a link between uh, a comment and a, and a quote. Yes, so, so I mean, um, ideally to handle that sort of thing. So, for, so for, first of all, in this work, what we want to do is we want to get rid of metadata. So mm -hmm. that's the main thing we want to sort of drop. But assuming you couldn't, what you would actually want, you could do it in an iterative fashion, is you could do an outfit estimation and sort of generate synthetic data for what this estimation would be like. 
recompute the network and do this iteratively, mm. and that might actually help in this case. It might do better performance. But yeah, but yeah, that's one thing. You have you have these features, and you're not actually changing the features, and they might be sort of harming the recommendation. At the last CPPR, there was a, a paper about fooling deep networks. Yeah. And yeah, it made me think a little bit. Are you not afraid that this looking for something which makes a jump in the fashionability score is is in this area of fooling your fooling your that. CRF uh, or? Uh, so the the, the mm -hmm. yeah. So the probably the input stuff here is not that high dimensional. So it's trickier to fool. So it's very easy to fool deep networks because your input is really, really high dimensional. And you just change a bit so it's not noticeable. It makes everything predict as like, uh, what was it? Ostrich, right? Mm -hmm. There was a paper that they said, we take any image and we make the network predict ostrich. And they just do it by really low. But in this case, it's, it's, it's much more simple. So especially the deep networks are small because um, we're trying to sort of keep generalization high and keep overfitting low. So, mm. yeah, okay, that maybe it's all. Mm. The main th thing at some point you will, if you want to continue this line, you mm. will have to go back with your recommendations to, uh, yeah. to uh, a fashion person no? mm -hmm. and ask him, what do you think about my system? Mm -hmm. uh, no? yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah, so right now as it is, yeah, you could probably game it, as you're saying, so mm -hmm. you could probably find a way to sort of exploit the stuff. But we're hoping that, I mean, if we try to use what's, what's going on with that versatile, uh, what's called that versatile deep networks and stuff like that, where you have one deep network and another deep network that's trying to fool the first one. So you could try to do that with here. You have one model and then you have another person model that's trying to fool the recommendation system. And you could probably use that in the learning to make it more robust. But yeah, but I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's something, yeah, you should probably take into account. OK. Uh, Maybe uh, so. The the Dali descriptor. Mm -hmm. um, the so sometimes you use light uh, robustness, sometimes illumination uh, robustness. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I did a lot of work myself in illumination mm -hmm. invariance, but that was something totally different. Mm -hmm. I found out reading the chapter, uh, and that was all about the color of the illuminant. So my mm -hmm. work was. Uh, so if you have a direct sun and mm -hmm. maybe a shadow, then the shadow is blue light, and uh, mm -hmm. the sun would give more yellowish light. Uh, would would the uh, so you have worked for I think uh, probably a half a year on this daily descriptor? Did you think about uh, extending it to color and and is it robust for also this sort of? I, I would guess it actually is robust for that sort of illuminates uh, stages as well. But so. Uh, there is work in extending heat kernel signatures to color. So basically, you, you, it's how you calculate the surface, how you calculate the Laplace and uh, Laplace Beltrami operator. So you can actually extend it to color. But uh, when I saw the results, they weren't very encouraging because they got like a 0.5% improvement or something like that. So we did not actually go in that direction. But yeah, you could extend it to that. Although you have to think that here we're doing a fairly large amount of approximations, and it's also for small image patches, so I'm not sure actually how beneficial. So it might be, if you want to have a, a better model of lighting, it might be, it will, might be better to instead of trying to incorporate that in a low level descriptor, to incorporate it directly in the application above, so in the application layer above. Like when you do the matching, try to take them to account. I think that would be more interesting, maybe, than try to incorporate it directly into the low level descriptor. And uh, on your uh, learned features with CNN, so mm -hmm. there you, I would say you're learning features for matching, and if yeah. I would say, uh, for example, the breakthrough with ImageNet was with uh, for the task of image classification, mm -hmm. um, and the SIFT is known to do work very well for both of these tasks. Mm -hmm. eh? And uh, so, the, what I was missing was actually, did you compare with the first three layers of AlexNet, where you will? Really, were you training something different, or was the result exactly the same? Uh, so, uh, um, and especially also because in your graph you show that up to level two is like SIFT, and uh, if you go to level uh, three layers, 
you you are actually much better. Mm -hmm. And similar results have been reported for uh, image that we are by Fidelity uh, this year. So it's probably learning something relatively similar. So I would have to look at actually one of the reviewers mentioned uh, the opposite. So trying to plug this into Alex Network and see how it improves, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think they're all looking at something similar. But what's actually pretty funny is that so uh, so this is pretty old work. We have much better version of this that hopefully will appear somewhere sometime, right? And uh, so what we actually saw is that I was looking at the filters, first layer filters, right, for the network without mining and with the network with mining. And what's really interesting is that they're virtually indistinguishable. But you look at the performance graphs, and you're getting three times the performance, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, you have to be sort of careful with this. So even though the filters might look very similar, the performance can be radically different. So in, in, with the mining, I, I, mean, I was trying to look at the filters to see, I mean, why is this mining working? Why, why is tracking these descriptors actually working? And uh, to see if I could get some insight, and I mean, you look at them, and you're like, well, wow, they look virtually the same. They just seem to get a bit harsher. So what happens is um, you sort of have these sort of gradients, right? So you sort of like Gaussian-like stuff. And they just get a bit harsher. And that seems to improve a lot. And, and, and the third layer, did you look at that? Uh, well, the problem with the third layer is it's hard to visualize because it's, um, so first layer is very easy to visualize because um, the data sets are actually grayscale, right? So you can actually visualize it as an image. Mm -hmm. And if it were RGB, you could also visualize it as a color image. But the problem with the third layer is the input is actually 64 layer image. So then you run into sort of visualization problems. So I but there are tools to visualize them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, to understand a little bit better. Yeah. yeah, so in this CDPR, there were like uh, there are several tools, uh, three orals, I think, on that, right? And so yeah, that's one thing we also want to look at and see how we can actually visualize this and actually use these tools to actually see what's, what the network is learning. And, and uh, But this, I mean, this is still something that's very active research, and there's lots of papers still coming up on this, and this is something we want to see because we actually want to understand what's going on here. And not just uh, say we got better performance, blah, 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 and that sort of stuff. But yeah, that's something we have to, we have to look into. So we've, it's hard to say. Okay. Maybe a last question about the post estimation. Which okay. I'm not an expert in, so it's mm -hmm. actually more a, a check if I understood something correct. Mm -hmm. So in the first method of chapter five, mm -hmm. uh, you, you estimate the covariance of each part. And, yeah. and you do that based on the output of a single part by looking at the covariance of the weights within this this part. Is that correct? Oh, so, so what we do is we first run the full 2D model, right? And so you have now the means for everything. And what we do now is we go backwards through the models. Now for each part we have its mean, but we go back to the uh, so the detector, so the scale pyramid where this was taken from, mm -hmm. and then we fit it. Gaussian to that. So basically, we run a full 2D model, which is a, a tree CRF type model. And then we go backwards to try to fit this to the image evidence it was estimated from. But, uh, but you say you fit it to the, the, the classification score. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so it's, it's, we're fitting it to the. Uh, but it's not really, the, so because in my head I was thinking, why are why you not look, looking at the detector output over this region mm -hmm. directly? Uh, it is the detector output, but uh, for example, you so for example, this is an, an example in the yeah. second model code. I mean, the first one is, is virtually the same. So what happens is, if you run the full model, you can see that this is giving a score here, while the maximum would be actually here, because this is actually constrained to the rest of the body, right? In, 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 in a full 2D pose model. So what we do is we say, given this point, we fit the Gaussian. So if you were to just look at the detector. You would have no sort of constraints on this, so maybe, I mean, if you look at uh, these sort of pyramids here, I mean, the maximum is probably nowhere near the real poles. So you actually need the rest of the body to constrain it. And that's what gives us a mean, and then the covariance is actually taken from the score. So you say, if I have a mean, what would be the covariance that would best fit this? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So it's my turn. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you and your advisors for inviting me. And uh, as you may know, I'm very much involved nowadays in, in managing. So I'm, and, and I have to be very selective on what I do for research. Mm -hmm. And this has been a good choice. And it has been very nice to read it. 
uh, where we I have had to get uh, involved in things that they haven't read for a long time, <laughs> and uh, that the presentation as well has been very very nice. So uh, after thanks, let me congratulate you and also your advisors for for the work and uh, very very uh, deep uh, and, and and global vision that you have got. Uh, the, what, what you are presenting is uh, part of, of the, the nice thing of what you are presenting is that you have uh, built a very nice structure mm -hmm. in, in your in your in your uh, document. Mm -hmm. So you will start from the mm -hmm. descriptors up to the. But I, I doubt if this structure was the real one <laughs> that you follow during your classes. Mm -hmm. Actually, the dates of your papers tell me something different, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I would like to know about that. I would like to know about the the, the mental path of your work and why you had to go back to look for something that you were needing, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I mean you're, you're completely right. I mean, you just look at the publication dates, and I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious what's going on, so, right? No, not, not, not completely, so I, I want to <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, so we started with uh, 2D pose estimation. So the idea was to do 2D pose estimation, but we found there was a severe lack of, um, and so we did 2D pose estimation, and then at the same time, when that was sort of uh, submitted, right, we would do other things. In that case, we worked on the descriptor. So we were working on that in parallel. And then with the 3D pose estimation, what we found is we were not really happy with the models being used there. So we could have looked more, and the descriptors also, but we were looking more at the models. And that's where all the model cost stuff came up from. And then the fashion stuff actually came in at the end when I did a research deal with Raquel. And Raquel wanted to do the fashion stuff because she's much more into using CRFs for that sort of stuff. And so then we went to that. So I mean, everything is fairly related, mm -hmm. but we, on the manuscript, it looks very structured and yeah. very nice, but. Which is part of the nice part of the next thing. I mean, well, to, to yes. be able to build something coherent at the end. Yes, but uh, yeah, so right now the, the main thing that's missing is since we did not do it in the current where. Now, what would be nice would be to go back and try to put it actually together. So one of the things, for example, a geodesic mixture model thing we used, that's a really nice model for pose estimation, but I have not had time to go back and actually use that yet. <laughs> so that's something we want to do. And also, um, we want to start applying this to stuff. So for example, the descriptors, uh, the, the deep convolutional ones, that's actually something fairly new. It's actually still under submission. And that's something we would actually want to start using more in other applications and use that uh, for other things and that's something we're working But there is no need on your other applications for those descriptors? Well, you could, so the knowledge learned from these descriptors is always going to be useful, especially for deep learning. So I think, while maybe it's hard to apply the descriptors directly, mm -hmm. the sort of frameworks and tools like Siamese networks and that sort of thing can be applied directly to the higher level problems. So you think it, they, that the results will improve? by introducing these new CMN descriptors, is that? I think maybe, so the descriptors themselves will improve results, I'm pretty sure about that. The main question is, is that better than just using a deep network, a larger one or a bigger one? So okay. that, I can't answer if it's better than some other approach, but I think it will improve, and in particular, the Siamese network ar architecture, I think that can be used for a lot of different problems. Okay. So I mean, that was originally used for face verification. And we use that for descriptors, and that can probably be used to say if outfits are similar or that sort of thing in this search. So even though it, it was not used directly, it's something that just to know how is going to be very beneficial for future tasks. Okay, and uh, when working with this uh, CNN, mm -hmm. um, all the insight that you obtain uh, when working with Dali, Dali, uh, mm -hmm. was that useful, or you have to start almost from scratch? So um, what's nice about Dali is basically you know a bit how descriptors work and you already know more or less what standard evaluation, what that sort of stuff you can do. So that was useful itself to sort of know what you can do with descriptors, but the information itself is not that useful directly. So actually we have in, in other work, we've actually evaluated the convolutional descriptors on the Dali data set. And we show that the Dali is still relevant though. <laughs> So while in deformation, the CNN descriptors do beat the Dali, in illumination, the Dali descriptors still five points above the CNN. Okay. Uh, you have answered also mm -hmm. a question that I think that Vincent was also commenting, mm -hmm. that in the joint 2 and 3D pose estimation, you are, just, you are using uh, directly to save the graph instead of the geodesic finite models because of that, no? because of that. Yes. Actually, yeah, the, the, the geodesic 
model is actually the response to the directed okay. assembly graph. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's a matter of time, not a, another choice. Yes. Okay. So with the results that you have obtained for mm -hmm. this uh, pose estimation, um, I, I was expecting to see, let's say, more challenging poses, something uh, dealing with sports, uh, ice skating, for instance, which is horrible for okay. poses. Uh, okay, so the, the main problem we have with this is uh, training data. So in 3D pose estimation, there's a pretty big problem that when you want good appearance data sets, you have no 3D pose. And when you have a really good 3D pose data set, the appearance is horrible. And you cannot train up an appearance model on that. So for example, ice skating, you would need training data for training a 3D prior for out skaters. And if we had that, we could apply it, but it's mainly, it's mainly a, a problem of data sets. So in 3D human pose estimation, at the time of the work, there was basically one data set, which was a human 3.6 EVA data set. That's it. Now there's, a, the, uh, there's another one, right? The human 3.6 M data set, which is much better, but still, I'm not happy with that. Because it's very hard to get 3D ground truth for natural images like sports or that sort of thing. But I think now they're working on that. I've seen two BMBCs ago, one BMBC ago, they did that for soccer. And so we're starting to see that maybe we could actually uh, do that. So I saw the other day there is a company called Red B, mm -hmm. which is a spin-off of the BMC. Mm -hmm. And what they are doing is to try to have a free view of uh, one single shot of a football match. Mm -hmm. So what they are doing is that they have the, the profile of everyone, so the silhouette, and they move to a 3D representation of everyone with the posture, with the, with the pose, mm -hmm. and they have something half manual, <laughs> but, but it works very, very nicely, mm -hmm. very nicely what they are doing. Over there. And I, it surprised me, I mean, uh, with mm -hmm. all the money that is uh, injected in sports, it's a surprise that they don't have such databases. Uh, well, they probably do, but I'm not sure they're public yet. That's, that's, I, that's, that's so I mean, the only one I've seen was a sport, was a soccer one, which okay. is by some. I think it was some BBC guy also, called or average like that, and they had. Uh, it was basically multi-view okay. cameras at for soccer, and they were doing very similar stuff to what I was doing. And another thing I'm dealing with uh, this poses. Uh, so, uh, in in, uh, in my group, they have work. I haven't worked on that, but they have worked a lot on, on gesture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, okay, they, they were looking at the problem as a kind of a scalable problem. So you detect the person, you detect the pose, mm -hmm. and then you detect the, the hands, and then you detect. The, mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about that? Have you thought about something, doing something scalable with your model? So going from joints to smaller joints, and so on. So, uh, yeah. I haven't really thought about that mainly because I haven't really seen that sort of data available. So when, when most of these works, the first thing you do is when you sort of have an idea is you try to find the data. And if there's no data, I mean, you can have a great idea, but if there's no data to try it. I, so if there was a data set with that sort of fine grained stuff, I think you could probably do some sort of hierarchical, very cool thing there. But yeah, having good 3D location of hands while having 3D location of the body at the same time in the same data set with high resolution stuff that that's, that sounds complicated. Okay, then I move to the to the application of fashion, mm -hmm. which I found it uh, even uh, unnatural, in the sense that uh, fashion, art, all all these uh, things, uh, mm -hmm. it's against like engineering, in the sense that they are looking for something, uh, they are looking for all layers. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean it, when, when you try to do the mean of something, mm -hmm. they don't feel like it's fashion or art anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's quite complicated. And, and for instance, you are injecting something like the symmetry in the model. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the biggest company now in Spain is the Cigual, <laughs> who is just looking for the contour. I mean, they are, they are pushing for uh, things which are strictly asymmetric. And uh, no, what I'm saying is that very complicated. And I, I think you have done a, a very good job. But the problem that we have always with this kind of arts and, and fashion is that they they don't want us to try to understand what they are doing. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't want. And, yeah. Definitely comment, but mm -hmm. on this uh, aspect, uh, I don't remember who of the two previous uh, people in the jury have commented that. But I was even wondering if the pose is necessary in the classifier because it, it doesn't look like be being so relevant. 
So um, we have experiments with autopose, and it is fairly important. But mm -hmm. in this case, the pose is very easy. Also, so you have to take into account that the status that the pose is very easy. But if you do not use a pose information, it is fairly bad. So you need some sort of representation of the pose here. Yeah, I, I was thinking that uh, with the CPMC uh, segmentation and the data obtained from the second order pooling of everyone, mm -hmm. some of the patches around, and a very simple graph saying you have legs on the bottom and uh, trunk on the top, maybe it's... Uh, I, I don't know if you really need to know where the limbs are uh, uh, for that application. So I think I have interesting results here, so actually... They're not the paper. But, um, there's some examples in the paper where, for example, the limb is wrong. And so, for example, the previous work, since they rely a lot on the 2D pose estimation, this leg would be missing. Mm -hmm. But in our case, by using the CPMC and that sort of stuff, we can rebuild this leg, mm -hmm. even though the other one is not. But what we find in this case, for example, is when the pose is wrong, even though we rebuild the leg, this is usually wrong compared to the other one. Okay. So I think pose is fairly important here, and the main issue is the data set is very small, and, and no one's really working on, on pose here. But if you have ground truth pose, you do get some performance increase. Okay. But yeah, so if you have a deep network, you could also argue, I mean, what everyone's doing now is that the, just by learning classification or whatever, the deep network is automatically learning pose estimation and that sort of thing. So I mean, what Tor Alba's group does, as they say, you learn classification, but your deep network is actually learning detectors at the same time. So you could probably do some sort of approach like that and forego an explicit 2D pose model to have an implicit one which your model learns. But in either way, in some point of your algorithm, you're going to have an either an explicit or an implicit model of 2D pose. And that's going to be fundamental care. Okay, so and that's my last question. Okay. Um, which could be the, the, the Take message, uh, take home message that, that you will <coughs> okay, so give I think, us. I think the take home message here is uh, instead of just beating numbers in data sets, just try to propose cool applications and do really nice things. So from, oh, I've worked on, on several different fields and that, or whatever you want to call them in this, and I think the most uh, fun and the most rewarding is actually the last work we've done, which was picked up by the news and all that sort of stuff. And that's more fun because even though the, I mean, you look at the numbers, they're not that good. Uh, I mean, the model itself is a bit, blah, but um, it's sort of inspiring to see these applications that have a, a potential tremendous impact in the world. And plus, um, they're also higher levels, so you have a lot much more uh, things you can do and much more playing with that. And so I think uh, the tame home message would be basically try to do more fun tasks and try to do more higher level things that you do not only think would be nice for publication, but they would be fun to have in an ideal world. So Can you move forward a few slides? The summary of your work or the conclusion that you remember? Because there was something there that they really like it. Uh, okay, the third sentence, I like it very much. And I, I would use that as compliment for your, for your comment. I mean, I, I think that this is extremely relevant nowadays. And if you put column, and enjoy with nice applications, <laughs> then it's, it's great. But it's true, I mean, at that moment, this is, this is paramount. Yes, because for example, in the, in the segmentation work, I did not invent second order pooling, I <laughs> but without that, I mean, you cannot actually, and so you actually have to, if you want to do high level stuff, you have to handle fairly well a fairly large amount of mid-level and low-level stuff, and always start interesting in applications and domains, which might be your own domain, but much might be related, or you can transfer knowledge from there and there. And this is especially the fashion work is what I found fundamental to be able to do anything. Okay. Okay, that's all from my set. Do you want to do any other questions or to no? The advisors, do you want to say something or thank you for uh, such interesting discussion and congratulations for for such a great work and hope you will have a successful career. <laughs> so I don't know the procedure. Should we remain here or should we go? No, we remain here and you okay. So in that case, please. Let me have to <laughs> you right. Okay, so we are all. So it's our pleasure to tell you that after a very brief deliberation, that the, the time has been taken by the bureaucracy, not the deliberation <laughs> itself. So after a very brief deliberation, uh, we have uh, decided to get you the highest non-secret 
uh, law <laughs> uh, given, which is excellent. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, now it's a votation, yes. it's a vote, and we have to wait for someone to open the mm -hmm. envelopes and to see if you get the cum laude or not. Yep. But so far, the excellent is, is ensured. Okay. So Thanks. Thank you very much, and congratulations. <laughs>